Hi, my name is Kim, and I was a victim of pastoral abuse. My husband and I, throughout our entire marriage, had a passion for ministry. Um, my husband's dream was to someday maybe be in full-time ministry. So we had participated in lots of ministries in different ways. We came to a new church in 2008, and um, when we got there, it was a mess. I mean, leadership was a mess, the ministries were a mess, lots of fighting, lots of, um, we just felt sorry for the leaders, and we felt sorry for the new pastor and his wife, and um, we talked to them, and we believed what they had to tell us, and we just, um, we just wanted to support them. We believed there's potential, and so instead of taking the red flags as meaning to leave, my husband and I took the red flags to mean that maybe because of our years of experience in church plants and different things, maybe that's why God sent us to this church, to help this group, and so that was our hearts. Um, we just really believed in them, and uh, and later in 2008, the pastor made it known that he wanted a worship ministries. They hadn't had a worship team ministry before, and um, it was going to be a big deal. And by default, I was the only one who'd ever had any experience with a team that was developed in a plant from scratch. Um, so my husband and I talked. We knew it was going to be a big thing to take over. Um, but we believed enough in the leadership and in the pastor and his wife that we thought it was worthwhile for me to try this. I was very nervous. I um, had to read and study. It took me 40 or 50 hours a week just trying to figure out how to lead a team. It took me a year to get the whole team put together so we could actually do the ministry. And um, the leaders told me, the elders told me to just go to the pastor. He is the one that you will get your mentoring from. You're the one you'll plan the services with. He'll be the one who'll give you the spiritual encouragement. He's the one you report to. And the pastor promised to work with me and make me a strong leader to mentor me. And I was just so excited. This was one of my dreams. I've always loved worship and music. And so that's how it went. And um, we met once a week on um, Thursday mornings with the secretary outside the door for years. Um, and for the first three years. And and then my uh, husband decided he would like to go ahead now and pursue his dream of being a pastor. And he started seminary. And um, I told him that's fine. It's, it took all our time away from each other with all this going on. But we just figured it was a short time. I wanted to support him. And he, it was his dream. It was his dream. He also started up the life group ministries the church has. Um, they'd never had a small group ministry, so he studied and researched all the different types of curriculum. He got it together. He trained each, each leader, seven of them, eight weeks apiece on how to be a life group leader and launched them. He was over the, all of that. He was also going to seminary, working full time, teaching his own life group while I hosted at our home, and he was teaching a adult um, Sunday school class at church. So you can imagine we had basically no time together whatsoever. And in the process, we still you know, encouraged the pastor and his wife. We bought him gift cards. We'd send them money on to, at times to help them out. Um, we'd take them out for dinner. We'd babysit their kids. Uh, we'd write them letters to encourage both of them. Our hearts were there, and that's what we did. That was our first three years. Um, but it finally, some things came crashing down on me from my past that I thought were gone. Um, some deep hurts and family issues came up. Both my grandparents died within about a year and a half of each other. Um, my autoimmune disease kicked up and I was in, in complete pain and agony every day. And, um, and I just, the ministry issues, I mean, the people that were taking the, my, my decorations, people who were fighting because I wasn't using the hymn books, I was using PowerPoint. People who um, were upset I sold the choir robes. I wasn't incorporating the bell choir into the regular service. I mean, there were so many people angry and coming at me during this transition. So Pastor, he, he became my, my mentor. He became the person I had to go to. That's who I was told to go to. I trusted, I trusted him. So um, when the family issues occurred, I, I, I went in depth and I thought, he's got three degrees, three master's degrees from a very prestigious seminary, one being in Christian counseling. And so it just seemed the reasonable person to talk to about these things. Um, I would have never talked to anyone, especially a man, about these issues ever if they hadn't had, not even just a pastor, even having the degree of biblical counselor. It just, I just trusted. I told my husband I was discussing these issues with my um, 
pastor and he understood and he was happy about it. He was glad. He goes, good, you're getting help. But I was just, I was just drowning between the health and all that. I was exhausted. And so the pastor said he would uh, mentor my husband so we'd have more time together. He would meet with him every other week for two years and then he would become an ordained minister. When he told, said that to us, my husband and I just grabbed each other. We hugged each other. We were like almost in tears. We were so excited that he would be able to live out his lifelong dream of being in full-time ministry someday. It was just a dream come true. Once he got my husband dependent on him to uh, reach this dream, I, we both, my husband and I were both running the two largest ministries in the church. I would say between my kids' friends and all of our friends, 98% of our life was in this church, everything. And when that happened, he started talking about our friendship, and I said, "Oh yeah, I can see it's like Sam and Frodo. How we, how um, you know Sam helped Frodo. You know, that's how I feel um, in this position. Um, or David and Jonathan. You know, and to me, that's how I viewed our friendship. But I even told my husband that Andy and I were very good friends. I mean, it was no secret. And um, I thought he felt that kind of friendship as well as he talked about it." And he finally told me, he said, just uh, call me by my first name. Don't, I don't like it when people call me pastor. I don't like when people assume that I should pray at a gathering because I'm the pastor. And I, you know, first I was like, okay, um, I've been raised with the pastor's family. I mean, I've been raised with pastor's families in my house all the time when I was a kid. I mean, we went out on dates together. We went out and hung out with their families. We did picnics. So it didn't seem so odd that he would ask me that. I, uh, I, I trusted because the pastor's families we were involved with as I was growing up were good people. And so I had no reason to be fearful of this man at all. And so I did that out of respect and in our friendship. Um, then when I started, he started pushing for a little bit deeper. I, uh, I asked him, I said, uh, is this okay? Is this in the Bible? Can, can we be that close of friends? And he said, oh, I don't see anything wrong. And he alluded to someone in the church, a leader in the church, who um, was mourning the loss of his married female friend who had passed away. And I thought about it and I thought, well, okay, it, it, it seems okay, it's okay. Well, <laughs> it was a few more months and he really, really started crossing lines. And that's when I started saying, hey, we gotta keep this going, we gotta get this on the right track. And the reason why is because I had everything in this church, everything, I have, I just, um, I just couldn't imagine what would happen. And so he would apologize and he would say, I'm sorry, you are so right, you are so right. I am so sorry. And I would forgive him and I would say, that's okay then. And we would go on and I thought we were fine. And and um, I was friends with his wife and his kids and I just, uh, you know, my husband and I both, we felt like we all were friends. And then he started crossing lines months later after that into 2012. And uh, he begged me to just let him express something and then just let it go, just let it go. Right now, I'm thinking my husband is dependent on you. Our whole family is in here. Everyone I care about is here and now you're pushing. And I, uh, he, uh, he called hotels and got me flowers where I was staying once while he was sitting next to my husband at a pastor's conference. And he sent letters and he said, and I just was, Oh my gosh, I mean, it, I, I needed his encouragement. I think I was emotionally enmeshed with him because of the things I'd shared, hoping he was helping me, and it seemed at first he was helping me. And so uh, I, I, I let it go, I let it go. I thought, I'm not, I won't let him do anymore. I needed his encouragement, his mentoring. I just thought that's what I needed. And then later that year, he started pushing sexual fantasies and, and writing those to me and that's and talking to me. And I said, that's it. I said, we've got, that's way over the line. That's way over the line. And he said, you know what? You're right. You're right. And so he pulled back completely. I mean, completely. And I had lost the one thing I did want, which was the emotional support and the mentoring and the friendship on the friendship level. And so, um, I told him I wanted to see a counselor. He said, hey, I don't think they're gonna understand this whole situation. I can help you with it better than they can because I understand it all. Um, 
it, I was devastated. And then I said, well, I want to tell my husband. Maybe he'll understand this and I can, you know, tell him and get support. He said, oh, no. He goes, if he does not understand our friendship, he doesn't get it, I'm going to lose my church, my family, my friends. He was so worried about losing all his things. And I, I just took a deep breath. I was so depressed. I was so depressed. And I just said, okay, it was just words. It was just words. Is it worth destroying all these lives, this church, everybody over words? Is it worth it? And I guess I said no. And I didn't know who to go to. I mean, he was on the radio. Every Christian counselor would have known him across town. I really felt trapped. I felt trapped. And I didn't want to kill my husband's dreams. And I didn't want to hurt my children. So we, he backed off for quite a while and apologized, but then he started crying and feeling bad and missing this and that and all this and that. And I said, okay, let's good, let's talk again. Let's, you know, I'm hoping for that emotional f encouragement again with my family issues and with the ministry and all that stuff. And so I let him slide a little bit here and there. I need to keep apologizing. And I said, don't do it again. You need to apologize. By 2013, he started pushing hard for a more physical relationship. And in May, he actually came to the park and said, hey, I'm here. It's the first time we'd ever, ever seen each other outside of, of church. And we sat and talked. And then um, later that day, I found out he had driven to my court. I hadn't seen him. I was working in the yard and had watched me. And I walked in the house and got this sobbing email saying, you should be my wife. And I just, my heart just broke that he was so hurt. And I just, it was just such an odd thing. And so when he went on his trip that month, I said to my husband, I said, honey, I said, I want out of here. I, I was crying. I was trembling. I was holding on to him and just praying the Holy Spirit would speak through my tears and just say, get her out of here, get her out of here. And he just didn't understand. He didn't know. And I couldn't get the words out. And I was so afraid that, hey, were people going to think I wanted this? Were people going to think that um, I initiated this stuff? Because I didn't. And were people, were the, was the church going to fall apart? Were my friends going to be devastated? It was so much on me. And I uh, just hope my husband said, yeah, let's leave. And then it would just, just leave and just get it over with. But uh, he didn't. And he said, you know, the ministry issues will resolve, Kim. You'll be fine. And he didn't understand. So that night, or that week, <laughs> I uh, took a night and I tried to kill myself. I took pills. I took wine. Um, he thought I had the stomach flu. I threw up for four hours straight until I passed out. I wanted out of there. I thought it would be better if I just died and nobody had to hurt and know anything. And it just, everybody could be okay. That was to that point. But when I woke up that next day and was alive, I told, I told Satan he can have what he wanted. I told God, I said, I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. And I said, I don't even think you're real. And so that's the month. I allowed the pastor to have whatever he wanted. And uh, he took me completely spiritually, emotionally, and eventually physically that year. I was just so angry. I, God, I hated him. And by October of 2013, I asked my husband, let's go get some counseling. So we did, and the pastor was really upset about it. But I just thought, maybe I can get it out. Maybe I can get the guts up. But it was up at a large church up north, and I couldn't do it. I was too afraid of what was going to happen to everyone. And so I told the pastor I needed six weeks off January of 2014. And uh, he, he said, and I told him I'm going to a doctor, and I'm getting some anxiety medicine. I've never used it in my life, but... I can't handle it. And he begged me not to do it. I wouldn't feel the feelings we had and all this stuff. I said, I'm doing it. And I did. And when I got back, I went to another church for a few weeks and got strong again. And when I came back in February, I, uh, I felt like I could do this. I could push him back, keep everybody happy, put things right, set it right. But it wasn't but a few months of emotional crying and emotional just guilt trips and just kind of like, look, you've already screwed up kind of thing. So we ended up back in the same thing. And then the two strings that were keeping me there was my husband and his ministry and his dreams. My kids and their friends. Some of the best friends I ever felt like I ever had. 
so I just let it go on. And uh, my husband told me this church was no longer a place he felt he could minister at, so the one string was chopped. And then my kids were being treated so bad by some of the other children that they didn't want to go there anymore, so God just snipped it. By November, there was a push, and it, I took it. I took the push. There was a little nudging, and I took it. And I went and got my secular job back. I called the pastor, went in immediately that day in November. I think it was November 7th. It was on a Friday. And I said, this is my resignation. I can no longer lead in these circumstances. I can, I'm no longer the worship leader I used to be. They need someone good. And um, I told him he needed to step down. He needed to figure something out. Oh my goodness, uh, I gave him three months just to give the church a chance to find someone. I'm still trying to spare the church. <laughs> and, um, and he cried and he cried every time we'd meet on a Thursday, he cried. And I hadn't had everything figured. I was still emotionally very bonded. I mean, I just was trying to physically get away and try to figure out what to do eventually. So it just kind of was a struggle those months, you know, with him and our relationship. It just was kind of, oh, I don't even know what to say. And he, uh, he would even tell me, he goes, I'd crawl in your coffin if you died. Because <laughs> you're such a big part of my life. I can't believe this, this wouldn't last forever. I can't believe it. And I just, I stood my ground. And I quit. In January 25th, 2015, I walked out of that door free. Free. Free at last. <laughs> Until a week later, I wrote him this letter. It was very, very mean. And it, he told me he was up drinking and upset about it all night. And so a couple days later, I said, well, why don't I come to the church? I would like to come to the church, actually, and meet with you. Um, is there any way that would work? And he texted me back. He said, no, why don't we take a ride? And then he said, hey, why don't I come to your house? And that's when I thought, this is it. This is the last, last round. And he came to my house. Um, I had that later that night I posted I sent him an email on the server my husband be working on on the computer that night with a very sexual content that he liked to be involved in and he responded and that night when I got home my husband had found it he was crushed as I knew he would be I couldn't bring the words I couldn't say it I just couldn't say it and I told him he could leave if he needed to and I'd help him and I didn't want him to be hurt anymore I was crushed and he let the pastor know he knew and the pastor said um, guilty as charged about your mercy. That was two lines. The next day, the pastor writes us a, uh, a letter telling us that he wants our kids to stay together and hang out. And I told my husband, no way. That's a way of tracking. Um, he asked for six months at least to continue preaching so he could stage a career change. Um, he asked that he be able to tell his wife on his own. And so we allowed that. Um, we got real quiet for about 10 days because we just didn't know which way to take my husband and I. But when we saw that the preaching was going to continue on for a while and his wife sent us a big long email telling us how they wanted, um, they're trying to figure out the right time frame to, to, to stage a goodbye because even if they tried to not tell the truth, no one would believe them anyway and they were done with lying and so now they were just going to stage a long go away. And he wrote and said he didn't want to be restored to ministry or the church at large, even though that he said that that's the only way he could be restored to God, but he didn't want it. That's what we have in our writing. So we decided it was time. And it, my husband, he said, hey, you need to turn in your notice this Tuesday night. And he sent a message back and said, um, I'll do that, but I'll do it the next Tuesday on a regular elder meeting. He was still trying to figure out a way. And so I started to have to disclose things to his um, wife that he didn't want her to know. And he sent us a message that said, tell Kim to stop telling her things. And I sent a message that said, until you do what my husband said, I will continue to send her things. So quickly he sent me a, okay, okay. And it was done. And he met with the elders at his house. They did damage control. Um, they met with the leaders at the end of the week. And then he confessed on that Sunday morning in tears and then he wrote a big long letter that didn't match anything he told us and uh, and then they had the forum and that is when they got up and said the other woman was non-repentant never wanted it to end and blackmailed him for something we just wanted the right thing to happen so they could not go to another ministry or another church and hurt anyone else 
We took the risk. We knew. We knew we would get whatever came our way. We knew. It would have been easy just to let him sneak out and not do anything, but we knew. We knew we had to. And so I ended up in a, a hospital for 10 days because I was suicidal. I wrote my obituary. I was done. I was done. Things came out of me I've held in for years. I was just done. And uh, that's when I was looking for help and I saw the, uh, the hope of survivors. I looked at that and I realized I, I'm not a victim. I'm a survivor. I'm a survivor. And that there's hope for survivors even now. And I read stories and people were so similar to my story, which just was strange. I just didn't know how to explain everything. Um, and so I got to tell you, the Hope of Survivors was that lifeline that came out and the sponsors that helped me and let me talk and let me express. And then they encouraged me and my husband, both of us. And I want to tell you something. Um, God wins. God wins. My husband and I, our marriage is stronger than it's ever been. It's beautiful. We re, re, um, did our vows last summer and exchanged rings, and it's all new. And, um, and because of the hope of survivors, we, uh, we were able to have something to cling to while we were trying to heal from, I had post-traumatic stress disorder. I, um, I still... I have panic attacks at times. I still cannot even go near a pastor, near a door, or shake his hand. I can't do any of that. I hope someday I'll be able to. Um, but overall, I can tell you one thing, God wins. He always wins, and thank God he put it in people's hearts at the hope of survivors to reach out to people like myself. And I, uh, I'm just grateful. Thank you, hope of survivors.